Recently, I've been thinking a lot about my work in in terms of it being a little bit more autobiographical. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking a lot about kind of the roots of my work and um, and really just like where I grew up and where I came from, um, which has always been really influential. And I think I'm a lot of my work has been kind of small fictions, and I and I think I haven't really realized how much those fictions really aren't that fictitious. In a, in, in a lot of ways, they're actually very autobiographical. You know, I grew up in, in Akron, Ohio, which is just a, a very industrial town. It's, um, it's known for rubber production. So, you know, people would grow up going to Firestone High School or Goodyear Junior High School or um, uh, Goodrich Elementary. Um, so like, and, and then our next closest town is Cleveland which is all steel production. So it's, it's just extraordinarily blue collar. And, um, you know, and I started, you know, doing art like in college. I mean, I was doing art probably my whole life and my family was all very creative people. Um, but really started seriously pursuing art in college. Um, and, and I was doing street photography and being on the street um, you know, just documenting people kind of in that Cartier-Bresson, Gary Winogrand mm -hmm. vein. Um, you know, not conceptual, very literal, and, you know, really admiring, like, the Magnum photographers who are street photographers. And, um, you know, seeing those people on the street and seeing those little exchanges, having dialogues with those people, all of that, plus the architecture of the place, I mean, the architecture that's built around an old industrial city, you know, um, all those things have, have influenced my work all along and are really coming out a lot now. Especially sort of like the thing about focusing on like the periphery of those cities, which is kind of where I grew up, you know, on the immediate outskirts of the urban environment. So it's, it's kind of barely suburban, but it's kind of where, you know, like your pawn shops and, uh, nail salons and uh, dry cleaners, and, you know, where those places are now, you know, and, and that's, you know, I grew up just a little bit beyond that fringe, so that was kind of the buffer between me and the city, and that's always where, you know, as a kid I would ride my bike through that, as, and even as a kid I would explore abandoned rubber factories, you know, and smash windows and spray paint and, um, you know, just sort of I don't know, be a young teenage boy with a lot of freedom in an urban environment, in a, in a nearly abandoned urban environment. Um, and that kind of thing, I mean, those, the exchanges with like, the dialogues with people and the, um, the exchanges, like seeing, you know, a car pull up to a curb and, and someone walk over and kind of lean in the window, you know, like that kind of action has been like one of the, like iconographies that I, think about in terms of, when I think about like the urban environment, I'm thinking about like iconographies mm -hmm. that has been, have been around me since I can remember. You know, I, I grew up in, in a little bar, you know, my parents were separated when I was a kid and my dad, I grew up, I lived with my dad and he would take me to this bar and the bar was just sort of full of all these college friends that would hang out and they, some of them had kids and I played soccer with them, I played you know, I, we would play at the bar, we would beg quarters to play pinball and play, you know, pool and maybe go walk and get an ice cream cone or, or go lay at the at the the landing strip of the airport, you know, and, and I just remember, you know, the, I've been thinking about all these people that I grew up around, like all these, all these dads and their kids and, um, you know, and kind of the names of the people, like Vanji Tanias, who was, who was who's now like a, an infamous fight promoter in that neighborhood. Uh, Ali Daoud, who was like a former Black Panther, who was a good friend of my dad's. And, uh, you know, a guy who I knew only by the name of Ray Ray. So, you know, it's just like, but like the, the stories that evolved around those people, I, I'm realizing, you know, the stories that my dad told me about, you know, a guy stealing Vanjie Tanias' car outside of a bar and Vanjie kind of interrupting it and being shot in the chest by a shotgun and then chasing the guy down 
And the guy stopped at a stop light, not realizing what was happening, and Benji ripped him out of the car and beat the crap out of him and waited until the cops got there. You know, like, it's those, those sort of narratives are the things that, like, I'm trying to find, like, those connections in my own work. You know, I'm looking for um, that, th these, like, hidden little narratives about what's going on and, and it's and it's all like you know I mean you know we, I mean this is an oral history but this is this talks about the oral history and a lot of my work has grown out of some out of like narrative fiction some out of these oral histories um, I'm really I was really influenced uh, probably in grad school or immediately after grad school by David Wanarovich uh, he did a book called the Waterfront Journals which is just pretty much like just monologues that he recorded with you know, hitchhikers and truck drivers and, um, you know, kind of transvestites of the Lower East Side and um, just, you know, a city of transients, essentially, is what he was trying to, to talk to, to people about and that their sort of experiences. And um, I, just, I love those monologues. And I've often thought of, about those as, like, being a true portrait. And I've often, you know, even in teaching, I've used those as, like, a as a, instead of doing a slideshow of portraits, like giving them this to read and that being maybe a more accurate bit of a portrait. Um, you know, and my work has been, has been character driven for a, as long as I can remember. You know, even for everything from drawings to photographs, the street photography, it was always character driven. And I just, you know, I love being able to look at, you know, the simplicity. I, I, I have a a book on my on my coffee table that sits there all the time that's um, uh, it's you know in the American West by Richard Avedon and it's just clean white nothing and just portraits of people and how you can you have this ability to, to look at them in a way that you wouldn't normally be able to look at them you know you, you have this uninterrupted gaze where you can explore wrinkles and you can explore their facial expressions and body language and just stare at them you know, it's everything like your parents always like, don't stare at it, don't stare when you're a kid, you know, but you're, you're just fascinated with people and you just want to see them. And I mean, oddly enough, like the, the wheat paste and street work, I mean, wheat paste came a little bit later for me in terms of street work. I was doing stenciling, <coughs> excuse me, um, and it was kind of the same process in a lot of ways as street photography. I mean, it wasn't roaming around with a camera trying to capture these hidden moments in the banal, it was about, um, but, but it was the process of being on the street and talking to people. And, you know, I was interested how, if, as, a, as a street artist, if I could take something and put something on the street, how that could create a, a bit of a narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, and I became really fascinated, probably in grad school, which is when I was doing a, the bulk of my street work or the beginning anyway of the street work. Um, and, you know, if I, I became in love with that idea of like urban legend, if I could actually maybe create an urban legend. And then I said, you know, and I was doing these kind of stories that were kind of ripped from, you know, flash, flash fictions or ripped from comic books and then kind of put in these alleyways. And I was interested if you walked, say, in Philadelphia along, and if you go to Love Park, which is sort of like the excuse me, the, um, like, tourist park, mm -hmm. and you can get, like, a map of the city, and it's, like, Betsy Ross House, and, um, you know, Ben Franklin, you know, the Unitarian Church that he started, and the First Christ Church, and all of this, the Philadelphia circle of things to see and do. You know, I, I was putting these stories in the alleyways along the way, so that you could, if you walked the route, you could read the story. You know, and, I mean, granted, a lot of it depended on you noticing and then being aware. Um, but I tried to write the stories in ways that you could experience them in any different order. So it was also for people that weren't just tourists, but people that lived in the neighborhood that would see it. And around this time I was wheat pasting and putting some things out on the street. Um, and I was in a coffee shop and I heard some people talking about one of the wheat pastes that I had done. And there were just some people in front of me in line. And I instantly was like, that's it. Like, the, what's on the street is cool, but this is the art. Like this, like this dialogue, this talking about it, is what I have been trying to achieve all along. Um, 
So from there, I mean, I just, I just went crazy, and I you know, put hundreds of things out on the street, and was doing a lot of, using a lot of repetition, using a lot of the same image, again and again and again and again, with the idea that I could maybe create a, that urban legend. Um, you know, and because it's wheat paste, they were nearly instantaneous, so it was something I could put up on the street overnight, and then the next day someone would see it and it was just instantly there. And it was something that, you know, they were black and white photocopies, so they, you know, would be a bit jarring, because, every, you know, the rest of the world sort of in color around them, and these were just these simple black and white photocopies, but they were pretty big scale, they are probably like seven foot tall. Um, and they were just, you know, you turn a corner and it was just kind of surprising to see this thing there. And I just, I liked that aspect of it. And that, that's what kind of grew, you know, this, the idea of, of, of making something that would instantaneously appear overnight. You know, when I was doing Wheat Paste in Atlanta, you know, I had the opportunity to do really big things. And that was fantastic for people to see just appear overnight. You know, on their, on their regular daily route to work, suddenly there was this huge thing and it was just... People love that, and there was so much dialogue about that, you know, and I, there was, some of them had like a website that you could go to, but I'm, I'm sure the vast majority of people never went to the website, and a lot of them didn't have a website at all, it was just about this mysterious thing that appeared, and, you know, that was, I don't know, I just, I really loved that idea that this, this kind of culture jamming thing would appear, mm -hmm. have this limited time, and then disappear, and the disappearance was often as, as important. Because then people talked about, like, well, well, there was that thing that was there, and then it vanished, and what happened to it, and who did that thing, and, and then someone says, oh, I think I saw something that, by that same person on this other side of town, and, you know, so then, once again, like, this dialogue begins. Um, you know, now, I'm not, I'm not doing that kind of work. Like, the evolution has kind of changed because I really wanted to begin exploring things inside. Because I've never really thought of myself as a graffiti artist. You know, I kind of, I fit some really small niches of, you know, there, there's like, the niche is called like, ephemeral street art. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a really small niche and it's, and you know, I mean, it's, it's now like a popular trend. I mean, you see, you know, obviously now, uh, you know, um, Jeffrey Deitch is doing all kinds of stuff with it at LACMA and there's, you know, Tons of galleries, I mean, that's like the big hot thing to do now. It's like, bring it, take an artist who's a street artist and bring them into a gallery. But before, you know, before it got too trendy, you know, I just, I wanted to really explore, like, what would happen if you took something big, like that scale, and stripped away a lot of the environment and made this very claustrophobic sort of environment that happens only in, you know, the museum space, the right kind of gallery space, maybe a university space. And that's, you know, I was pursuing that idea of, of, of those sort of venues that where I could really control, like, the amount of space that you could get away from something. Because the, the distance that happens when you're driving by in a car or walking by on the street, when you have an infinite amount of space around you that you can walk away from it, doesn't create the same sort of effect as when you have a limited space and you can only back up 20 feet, you know, and you can... You're, you're so much more confined in the space with this large thing, and you just experience it in a really different way, and I was interested in that experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, I've been fortunate that, I mean, with MOCA and um, with a couple universities recently, I've been able to really, you know, have that opportunity to explore large within, you know, a much more confined space. Having, having done the Working Hours Project and having worked in that space, really kind of opened up. That, that's when I began to feel like I like the sense of claustrophobia mm -hmm. that I can create within a, within a, a clean white cube. Um, so that's, that's been the direction really since MoCA. I mean, I, you know, going into that show, I didn't, you know, I, kind of, I knew what I wanted to do, and I've been perpetuating that. And I've, and I've also been mixing media a bit more since the MoCA show as well. Like, you know, like projected video along with, you know, working with sound, which I, there was a little bit of sound at MoCA, but it, that didn't really work out how I wanted because I was, I was essentially trying to make sound that sounded natural, but it sounded so natural like no one knew that I made it. <laughs> like there was, I think, chimney Swiss living in the walls that sounded exactly like the birds that I had recorded for my audio, so it was like it didn't matter. Like they were already there, 
So, um, but you know, so I've been working with sound a lot more and, and working, um, you know, with like little bits of music. Um, and I don't know, you know, sound's a tricky thing and it's, it's funny, I've, I've been talking to some artists that are video artists and also sound artists or, or, or working within sound and video. And it's funny how many of them say they don't really like sound or video when they go into galleries. Hmm. And I think I've been the same way. Like, I'm quick to ignore video or sound installations for more visual stuff. But yet, I'm, for whatever reason, I'm being drawn towards making video and sound stuff. Hmm. Um, and, and of course, the more that I make it, the more I'm interested in what other people are doing with that. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging for a viewer in a lot of ways. I mean, I feel, I feel like the work that I, was, that I made for Mocha and that some of it that I've made since, you know, I'm making video in a much more approachable way because I've got something, a, a very static element. And then the video is, I'm, I'm approaching it kind of the way in which I approach photography. Like, it's very still mm -hmm. video. I mean, it's like very, sl very soft, very slight movement in the video. Um, which is, you know, probably just me bringing my photographer's way of thinking to, to video. And I'm not trained as a video artist, so I don't have, like, methodologies or theories or any of that stuff that, you know, someone that maybe went to school for six years or whatever for, you know, for video would understand. Um, uh, one thing about my work that I will say is that with everything that I've done after kind of there was a certain point probably between undergraduate school and graduate school when I really abandoned straight photography. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the time, I think I was kind of fascinated with conceptual works. I was fascinated more with sculpture. Um, you know, I had seen a Juan Munoz show that just blew me away. And that, I think that one show was a huge shift in my work and made me really want to pursue different sort of, you know, photography so clean. And I just, I, I remember, you know, just going to different artist studios and like, I remember like, the way I mentioned which of my studio kind of looks now, I remember being fascinated with like kind of the junk of the studio and the debris and the dirt and that, the overspray and, and all that stuff and loving that texture. And I remember as a photographer just feeling like, I don't have that in my life. Like everything is kind of clean and boxed and archival and put away and archived. And, and I just, some big part of me just didn't want that. I wanted the grit and the grime. Um, now I can't get rid of it <sighs> in my studio. It didn't matter how much I try and clean. But, and that, that Juan Munoz show was so textural but also extremely emotional and it had narrative elements and character driven uh, story and I just I was in love with that work and I've seen many of his installations since then and, um, you know and, and have always been really influenced by by his work um, and you know kind of around that time I began exploring all these different mediums and I think ever since then I've been a big problem solver like, it's one of the things that I just, I like in the studio is to solve problems. So if I'm having conceptual struggles, you know, I'm feeling not really inspired, I don't really know what direction to go, I can sort of take on a technique that I've never done before and just try and figure it out. And maybe it's something that, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the things that I try and do, there's no, there's no textbook on how to, you know, how do you put paper on a wall? Like, you can, you can wheat paste it, you can... You know, I've used wax, I've used nails, you know, and then how do you make something really huge out of paper? Because paper only comes in, you know, you can maybe get in a roll, but even the roll has a, has a width restriction. So, I mean, there's always these little problems that I have to figure out. Um, right now, I've been working with camera obscuras, which is kind of good for me because it's, I've been reading all this history of photography, and I've been, um, I don't know, and it's, I mean, for me, it's kind of easy. But in the same ways like camera obscures are, they're, they're a weird little instrument. And to make them into something that's interesting to look at is kind of hard. So, because I mean, I've seen several shows of, of camera obscures and most of the time they're kind of boring. 
or they require just the right, like you have to stand in just the right spot and the light has to be just the right kind of thing. And, and then you just like, I don't know, it's hard. So I'm trying to make something that's, that's interesting that anyone can look at from many different angles. Um, you know what I mean? That's just one example of, of what I'm trying to do, you know, technique wise. Sometimes I'm, just, I'm also doing all this work that's just cut paper. That's another kind of my go-to things when I'm lacking inspiration. It's just the act of cutting, you know, using an X-Acto knife and paper has, for me, has gone, you know, pre-grad school up to now and it's just a constant. You know, whether it was cutting out wheat pastes or now it's like really delicate cut paper work that's like paper on paper on paper, you know, with a little bit of paint applied in between. Um, you know, really just, but it, it's that act of, of that cutting that is just, I don't know, it's really wonderful to me. It's very meditative and quiet and, and calm and, you know, the kind of, you know, I'm, I'm definitely of the philosophy of like, you just have to work. You know, if you sit around and wait for inspiration, like, you're not, it's never going to come to you. You just have to, you just have to work. Um, and I'm not, I'm not married to paper being the medium. It's just, for me, it's been something that I can work with quickly. I can work with it inexpensively. Um, but I'm not, I'm not at all, I wouldn't be upset if it was made out of, you know, laser cut steel or if it was made out of, vinyl or if it was made out of some other sort of plastic you know because i think graphically and aesthetically it's all going to work kind of the same especially like video being projected on it mm -hmm. when the video is projected on it you can't really see what it, the material is anyway so it doesn't really matter as long as it's not reflective or something like that it'll be fine so you're not attract you're not, not attracted but not married to it in the fact that even though your experience with paper being this kind of not ephemeral, but it's it's history attached to wheat pasting for you, and you tend to probably do the majority of your photography on paper. Mm -hmm. um, it can translate into other materials then. It definitely can, but I, and I think I would always use paper as, as my sketching tool. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm not, the final product could be something else. One, the one thing I do really like about paper is that paper always shows the artist's hand. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas, you know, something that's like cut by machine or something like that, you know, it has, the one thing that's a little bit less attractive about that is that it, you, it's not going to show my hand in the same kind of way. I mean, you'll get the same kind of curve that comes naturally out of my hand, translated through the pencil to the computer to that. I mean, like, the curve remains a constant, but it's, you know, the way in which paper shows when you overcut a line, mm -hmm. it, it, there's no, like, erasing a cut. Yeah. So that's always there, whereas a laser and, you know, computer stuff is also precise and accurate. Um, and I, you know, I like, I mean, I, you know, the laser cut thing is just, I'm waiting for the right person with the right amount of money to make it and yeah. really see how it looks. I might do it and be like, oh, that wasn't that great. Yeah, I think about your work in relationship to the belt line and things being able to exist outside for a long period of time. Yeah. And that's, that's been an issue too, is like, you know, because I work with, I've made a lot of public work. There's been a lot of talk with, you know, bigger public art agencies that want me to make something, you know, that's going to last for, you know, 10 or 100 years. Yeah. And then, you know, and that's kind of where, like, I've come to, like, you know, being, th the thoughts of, like, using steel or using plastics. Yeah. Um, just because, I mean, you have to have something that's going to last, you know, a long time and that can be powder coated and blasted with UV light and, you know, it's going to look exactly the same on the day you installed it as it will, you know, a hundred years later. I moved to Atlanta because, um, you know, I got out of grad school. I was about, I have a son who was at the time when I was in grad school or finishing grad school, he was about eight or nine. And I'd been away from him for a while because he lived with his mom and we were in different states. And I just, I couldn't do that anymore. And, you know, when all my friends were sort of leaving Philadelphia for New York, or, you know, making relationships with galleries in Philadelphia and, you know, all this. I just kind of cut all my ties there and just, you know, to be close to him. And, you know, and the idea was that I would get here and as soon as he graduated high school, I would have a truck packed at graduation and be like, I love you, good job, see you later. And it's just, you know, I've become entrenched in a lot of ways. I mean, it's just, 
you know, the art world has been good to me here. There's so there's been a lot of support. Um, there's also, you know, I have a job that's that's really ideal. I can I can do art on my own terms here, whereas I have you know a lot of friends in New York and LA that, you know, are still like you know making a hard road of it. You know, they they're living like I did when I was in college, and I I'm 41 now, and I just I can't. I've gotten soft. I don't want to live on a shitty futon with in a in a big warehouse with a bunch of other people anymore. You know, I, I like my standard of living. And you know, and it's, um, you know, it hasn't prevented me being in Atlanta from showing in New York at all. You know, um, I had representation in New York for a long time. I've got representation in Philadelphia. Um, I've got representation here. So I mean, there's no shortage of, of like people wanting my work. Um, and it's you know, and I I'm able to have a studio here that you know, and I have friends from from New York or LA or. God forbid, San Francisco, you know, that come and see my studio and they just like die over what I have. And that I have land to build more, you know, that I can have like three times this much studio if I really want it. Um, you know, but, you know, the other thing about Atlanta is that, I mean, architecturally it has not been a good influence on my work. Other than, you know, I, I have lived no further than a mile away from railroad tracks my entire life. Hmm. So the sound of trains, like the whistles and the clacking of things, or like the, the, the slamming together of huge boxcars, has been a resonant sound in the back of my head my entire life. And right now I live a quarter mile from railroad tracks. And it's... That is one thing that's been really nice about the South, is like, and has had a strong influence on all my work. Um, I actually went and saw a show in, um, in Cleveland, Ohio, just recently, that uh, a guy did a whole show on like hobo culture. And I didn't realize that like, there was actually like an underground city in Cleveland, Ohio, that was a hobo city. that was literally underground, and it was, it's built on the old, um, as part of the old canal system, the Erie Canal system. Um, and then, you know, and since I've worked here and I've been doing some projects, I've talked to a lot of people that are kind of like out of hobo culture mm -hmm. and like contemporary hobo culture and, um, you know, and that once again, like, I mean, talk about a wonderful, you know, kind of, um, oral history. I mean, that is just mm -hmm. amazing. Um, so I've got, I've, you know, not that that really incorporates into my work, but I, I like drawing a little bit on that kind of oral history as well. Um, yeah, so, so teaching is, you know, I came to teaching, I think, the way a lot of artists come to teaching, like, and which was begrudgingly. So I just, I, I didn't want to do it. I felt, I mean, you know, I didn't go to grad school to teach. Mm -hmm. And to me, I wanted, I just, I went to grad school to be a better artist, and that was it, you know. And to me, I didn't want to dilute that by teaching. You know, and in some ways I thought if I did teach, that was kind of diluting the reason I went to grad school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was, when I left, when I, after I graduated, I had, you know, I had an assistantship in, all throughout school, but it was with, with the museum, or with the gallery there. Um, and then the photo professors there just railroaded me into teaching. They said, hey, we've got a class, we put your name on it. So, unless you want to screw a bunch of students over, you're teaching it. So, I, you know, so I taught the class. And, you know, thank God it was a great group of students. Because I've had really bad groups of students since then. And, you know, and I've had classes that if they would have been my first class, I would have probably never done it again. Mm -hmm. But this was pretty advanced level students, all like advanced level within other disciplines, all taking photo, photo for the first time. Wow. And so conceptual thinking was there and they just, it was me just showing them a technique and helping develop ideas, and they just took it and ran. And it was great, and it was like, you know, I mean, it sounds so cliche, but like seeing that spark happen with someone, that spark of inspiration, and them really falling in love with something, you know, it just, that made me want to teach. Cool. And, you know, it was something, my, my parents were teachers, um, and, you know, maybe that was another thing too, like not wanting to do what your parents do. Um, 
but you know, I really, I understood the draw of wanting to teach, and I, I understood, you know, seeing that inspiration, and, and it became something, I did it, you know, at, on a part-time basis to supplement, you know, I would, I would do commercial photography, and I would do, I would, I, I worked as a preparator in museums for a long time, um, I did, you know, just about anything that I could to make money, you know, but with the idea that my primary goal has always been to make art, you know, and it was always, and sometimes it was hard, sometimes I had, you know, 50 hour a week jobs, and I would come home and then try and, you know, work on a show, and, you know, that was exhausting, and, you know, teaching, especially, I've been, full, I've been a full-time professor now for six years, I'm going up for tenure pretty soon, and it has afforded me, one, like, it's, it's people that actually respect me as an artist, which is a rare thing. You know, it's normally like you're on the bottom of the totem pole, no one cares, no one, you know, it's like, I don't know, there's just, it's like, it, teaching and like a residency are the two like rare instances that like you're treated so well because you are an artist. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and obviously having an exhibition, like that's the other great opportunity to be treated like, you know, feel like you're, you're doing something worthwhile. Um, and, you know, for me, like teaching, and I, and I teach exclusively all the photo at Kennesaw, and I have revamped that program. I just, I got in there and just tore it down to the foundation and built it all back up. And it's, it's a whole different program than it was six years ago. Um, and, and it's funny because I'm not really a photographer. I mean, I, I'm schooled as a photographer, and I can teach it in and out, but like I'm not, I mean, what I make is not photographs. So it's, um, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, like, you know, you go to a faculty website and it's examples of artists' works, and like mine would fit maybe better in like the painting department or somewhere like that. Um, but I also, as part of teaching, what I, the one thing that I do that's, that I feel like is really important is I, I, I almost always use interns. And, you know, a big part of my teaching is, always comes from like, what is it like to be a professional working artist? You know, too many times, like, students graduate from school and, like, with, from, with an art degree and there's no real-world preparation for anything. They're like, okay, you know how to paint really well. Go out there. You know, but no one talks about, like, what it's like to, like, mount an exhibition, send out a press release, do your own postcards, you know, handle business cards. So I've worked a lot on, like, the professional practice aspect of, of being an artist with students. Um, I've taught a lot of those kind of classes, and I incorporate those in all the classes that I do now. That's great. So, um, and, you know, and the other thing, you know, that I do with students is, like, I take them on studio visits. You know, I secure a bunch of artists and go to studio visits. We do, we do, I probably do more field trips than anyone else in my department because, like, you got to see the art. You know, showing you slides is no representation at all of mm -hmm. what the artwork is. Like, you, you have to see the artwork. You have to feel it and smell it and touch it, even though you shouldn't touch it. Sometimes. <laughs> but well, I mean, you know, for instance, there was a there was a there was a show actually at White Space of these like, kind of silicone butts and whatnot, and you were supposed to like slap them, you know. And it's like you can't. I mean, in slides, you just can't. You don't get that. You don't get like the visceral feel and look, or the way in which light passes through a sculpture, mm -hmm. or. You know, sometimes, so often people do all this work with with uh, graphite, and you just, like, graphite is dead in photography. You know, like, it's only alive when you move, and, you know, and the light shimmers on it. Um, so, you know, it's just, I, I just make it a big effort to, to show them the work. And also, they should know what galleries are there for them at different stages of their career. Mm -hmm. You know, that they shouldn't be walking in the door of Solomon Projects, you know, the day that they graduate, you know, with a portfolio, because they're just going to get thrown out on their ear, you know, but like, but Beep Beep and Youngblood and, and, you know, Mint and Wonder Root and, you know, like the old iDrome, you know, all those are sort of like that first step. And, you know, and I just show them like different artists at different stages of their career and, you know, I allow them to kind of compare themselves. To the University of Akron, um, which has a weird, you know, I, I started, actually I started out at Kent State University. Uh, a 
horrible, horrible, horrible student as a high school student. I think I graduated high school with a 2.3 maybe. At, and I, I might be over-exaggerating. I'm probably over-exaggerating. Maybe more like a 2.1. Um, I just, I was not interested in learning anything that I didn't want to learn about. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things like, I don't want my students to know this, but I'm, the, I'm still the same way. Like, I will not, you cannot teach me something if I don't want to learn about it. If I want, if I'm interested, I'll learn it back and forth and it's no problem. So I started out in architecture at Kent State and, and just immediately went on academic probation and left. And ended up at the University of Akron and, you know, kind of eventually wound my way into the art department. Um, and I, I have to say, I mean, I was really lucky because that art department's phenomenal. It's still, to, to go back and visit it now, after working, I've taught at six different schools, I'm still amazed at University of Akron's quality of work that they produce out of there. And, I mean, they, they have really good faculty. You know, it's the lineage of um, artists that I came out of were really conceptual. You know, one of my, um, my main advisor, kind of mentors, was like Robert Rauschenberg's assistant in New York in the, in the 60s. You know, another guy had been a student of Gary Winogrand's. Um, these guys, two of them were good friends with Lee Friedlander, who came and did projects in Akron, Ohio. John Copeland's, who's a photographer, was the director of the Akron Art Museum at the time. So, I mean, there was a, there was a really good environment going on there. Um, and, you know, when I was shopping for grad schools, you know, I asked these guys where I should apply. And they said, apply to all the best programs. And then apply to a couple that aren't. You know, it's like, hopefully that'll be your fallback. And, um, you know, and I, I just, I feel kind of lucky that I got into the Tyler School in Philadelphia, and it was, you know, one of my top three picks of schools, and, you know, it was, it was a really, really conceptual program, and it was something where I didn't have the language to talk about things when I got there, which was great, because I, you know, if I, if I got there and I just could fall into the groove that I was in, you know, in Akron, I felt like a big fish in a little pond. And I got to Philadelphia at, at the Tyler School, and I felt like kind of everyone was like that. So, like, everyone was this very level playing field. And, and it was really hard. It was extraordinarily hard. And, you know, I felt good. I felt like in undergrad, you know, we, did, we read a lot. I had a good bit of theory. But it was all very specific photo theory, because I was kind of a very straight photographer. Um, Tyler is just like so insanely conceptual that you know people were making things that I just I could I couldn't talk about them I didn't have the language at all to talk about them and you know it's funny because you would talk to the the janitors and they'd be like man I don't know what's art and what's trash around here I don't throw anything away because the, like literally there would be like a heap of dry sheetrock mud that's painted pink with a bunch of shit sticking out of it, you know, and like, that's some serious art, like, that's some seriously celebrated, intense stuff, and I just didn't have that language to talk about that thing, and for me, like, it was, it was great to, to be forced into that environment and have to, to really think, you know, and use, use it, a whole different set of language, a whole different set of, um, art skills, art thinking skills, and, you know, and there, I mean, it's every visiting artist, you know, was the hottest thing in New York. I mean, John Curran and Coco Fusco and um, Lisa Uscovich, you know, Lisa Uscovich taught classes there. Coco Fusco I had classes with, you know, and it's just, it's like all the people that I've read about in magazines my whole life, you know, were suddenly standing in front of me, in front of me, intimidating and terrifying me. <laughs> but teaching me along the way. So, you know, Tyler was, it was great. I, I didn't, uh, I probably didn't fit in to the, to the photo department really neatly, but I don't know what other department I would have fit into. Uh, my dad taught yeah. um, inner city middle school. He taught science and English. 
he primarily taught English to um, a lot of Laotians and Hmongs. So, which is, I don't know why there's like this huge population of them in inner city Akron. Um, and then my mom has been a, um, like, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade teacher for 30 some odd years. Um, I have an uncle who is um, head of, he's head of U.S. Creative Design for Scripto Tokai, which is like the Scripto Pen Company. And uh, my grandfather, so that that uncle's father, my dad's father, was a, a master engraver, and it actually engraved um, a rifle for uh, Teddy Roosevelt that's in the Smithsonian. And I only knew this because we got a Smithsonian magazine one time, and we were like, what? So, um, and it's funny because I had the original, I had the wax, um, I had like, it's like these wax tracings of, of all the engraving work, uh, which have since unfortunately been lost, but, um, so yeah, so, and my dad was a really amazing, um, did a lot of things like his own, he would do his own gunsmithing and would make his own like fishing rods and hunting knives and he was a big outdoorsman, um, but did a lot of work with like scrimshaw and engraving. And, you know, had learned it from my grandfather, and um, and then had another uncle that was like a metalsmith and, and is still a musician, um, a photographer, an uncle who was a photographer on my mother's side, and um, you know, I mean, no one had really gone to school in the way that I had gone to school for art, you know, in like a, with like a BFA and, a, and an MFA, but it was you know more kind of born out of craft or you know, as a hobby, um, but that being said, like a lot of them were really appreciative of what I did. And lately I've been coming to terms with like, I'm not an artist that sells much work. You know, I'm an artist that makes things that are often temporary. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it took me a long time to come to terms with that. You know, I mean, it doesn't keep me from making objects, you know, and you know, and I still, and I, and I sell some work, but I'm just, I'm not someone who's like, you know, I have a friend who had a, two major exhibitions in New York and sold over 70 works in two years, and, and that's not me. Um, last year I spent a bulk of my year making this really huge piece that was in the university setting, and it's, so you know, like, I think at the end of every year, like, I look at, like, how many works did I make this year? You know, some, are, some years it's like, six. You know, I mean, and I mean, like, I made a lot of really big things last year, and very, very little small stuff. Well, that's a good thing about being a photographer, because I always have good documentation.